Well, beloved, last week we heard about Jesus' temptations in the wilderness. At the end of a 40-day fast in the Judean wilderness, the adversary appeared to Jesus. He put him through three temptations, and they're all temptations to exercise divine power. The first was for him to turn stones to bread and eat, in other words, to rely on his own power to provide rather on the Father's. The second was to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple and prove to himself and everyone else that he really was the Son of God. The third was to become emperor, ruling over all the known earth. We have to assume that these really were a struggle for Jesus, otherwise they wouldn't have been temptations by definition. Jesus denies all three, choosing to remain within the constraints of his humanity and dwell among us. The three temptations that Jesus faced are really the basic areas of sin that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Security, certitude, and power. The so-called seven deadly sins are all combinations of these three. And the thing that unites them is that in each case, when we fall into these sins, we take upon ourselves functions that are meant to be the providence of God alone. This week we hear the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, a member of the Jewish sect whose teachings are actually closest to Jesus himself. Disputes between Jesus and the Pharisees are kind of like sibling fights, which, if you have siblings, are some of the worst. But Nicodemus is more than just a Pharisee. He's a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of Judea. They manage the parts of Judean life that are delegated to them under the authority of the Roman governor. Nicodemus seems to be genuinely intrigued by Jesus' teaching. He's heard of his healing powers and teaching, but he's also wary of Jesus. Jesus has already thrown the money changers out of the temple, disrupting worship. And he wants to find out more. But he's concerned for his status if he's seen meeting this considered heretic, so he goes under cover of night. Jesus and Nicodemus begin to talk. Nicodemus courteously hails him as a teacher from God since he has heard of Jesus' miracles. But Jesus immediately responds, No one can enter the kingdom of God without having been born from above. Nicodemus is a little off balance at this point. No doubt he expected that Jesus would return the polite greeting, considering Nicodemus' standing among his people. Instead, Jesus has challenged Nicodemus outright. No one can enter the kingdom of God without having been born from above. The Greek word here that's translated above actually has a dual meaning of above and again, and English translators have to choose one or the other, but the dual meaning is probably intentional on Jesus' part. And Nicodemus, a very literal-minded person, latches onto the meaning again. How can one be born again? Can one enter into the mother's womb a second time? He's confused. As a scrupulously observant Jew, he probably felt that his genealogy as a descendant of Abraham and a careful observance of Jewish law put him into right relationship with God. Jesus tells him he must be born both again and from above. Despite the fact that many Christians assume this passage means making an adult profession of faith, it's important to note that birth really has very little to do with individual choice. When it's time, we're born whether we want to be or not. It's not in our control. Jesus challenges Nicodemus' assumption that people control their holiness, that relationship with God is something earned by their actions. Instead, Jesus says, it's something we are given, a gift of grace that we only have to accept. For Nicodemus, this is really difficult. He's comfortable in his certitude that ancestry and observance of the law put him in favor with God. Certitude is the second temptation of Jesus in the desert. Throw yourself from the pinnacle of the temple and prove yourself. And it's always been a particular temptation for humans who are religiously oriented, and it is Nicodemus' problem. Religion is a response to the universal human understanding that there is something that separates us from the divine, something not quite right. Vincent Donovan, who worked as a missionary among African tribes, remarked that every tribe he visited had a concept of sin. There were taboos, things that could separate a person from community access. He said that one thing that was missing from some of these cultures was a way to bridge the gulf, a way to restore relationship. All religion is at its root as a human endeavor, an attempt to remove the gulf and bring us back into the presence of the divine. And while we certainly make claims for the truth as we see it, we as Christians recite very specific claims about Jesus in the Creed every Sunday, to pretend that we have a monopoly on all truth and therefore a right to judge others is pure hubris. Our sinful human discomfort and ambiguity often leads us to declare that the truth that we know is the only truth and that those who disagree with us are therefore outside with whatever consequences that brings. This leads to hatred, anger, and violence, and it's something we must always guard against. Sven the Lutheran was on a cruise when he accidentally fell off the ship. He swam to an uninhabited island where he made his home for 20 years before help arrived. 
He was showing his rescuers kind of proudly around his island. This is my house, and this is my barn, and this is my church. Then one of the rescuers pointed to a second building that also had a steeple with a cross on top and asked him what that was. Sven scowled. Oh, that's the church where I used to belong. You don't have to look very far within Christianity to find those who pride themselves on certitude, those who believe they know who is in favor with God and who is not. And this is despite multiple biblical injunctions that we are not to judge and that we do not know whom God counts as righteous or not. In local surveys, non-Christians were asked what words describe the typical Christian, and the most common words used to describe us were intolerant, smug, and hypocrite. And on one level, it's correct to call us hypocrites because all human beings are hypocrites. We all articulate standards that we don't always measure up to. But the smugness and intolerance is a problem because that seems to indicate that we're somehow immune to sin as Christians. But the church is a hospital for sinners, not a club for the perfect. There is no question that we have to exercise human judgment, but it should always be with restraint, gentleness, and, gentleness and humility, knowing that we could be wrong. And we should always be ready to make amends when our judgment does indeed prove incorrect. When we practice certitude, we put ourselves in the place of God. We take on an ultimate function of judgment that is God's prerogative alone. And of course, this includes making negative judgments about ourselves as well. Genesis tells us we were made very good. And the reality of sin does not change our fundamental nature. We're all very good and of ultimate worth to God. All the more reason to examine ourselves for places where we notice the speck in another's eye while ignoring the log in ours. During Lent, we should examine ourselves for certitude. Where have we written off other people as worthless? Where have we written off our problems as hopeless? How have we exploited the weakness of others to prop our pride up by saying, at least I'm not like that person? Certainty is not a Christian value. Trust is. Trust that God loves us so much that he will indeed mend his relationship with us despite the fact that we have fallen short in the past, are falling short now, and will fall short again in the future. Christian hope is found in a messy, enigmatic relationship with Jesus rather than a checklist of obligations and rewards. There's hope for us in the story of Nicodemus. He's changed by his encounter with Jesus even if not immediately. We hear about him twice more in the Gospel. At his next appearance, he argues unsuccessfully with the rest of the ruling council that Jesus is innocent, and when they condemn Jesus, Nicodemus remains silent. But in his last appearance in the Gospels, Nicodemus comes with Joseph of Arimathea to prepare Jesus for burial. And although we have no text describing his change of heart, it appears that Nicodemus has turned a corner. His actions put him in defiance of religious authority and risk everything that he treasures. Tradition holds that he became part of the early Christian movement and was martyred in the first century. He's a regular subject of Eastern Orthodox iconography. Nicodemus was able to give up his treasured certainty and follow into the uncertain future of the early Christian movement. And if we're to follow Jesus through the example of Nicodemus, we must examine ourselves, eliminating those places where we allow our certitude to keep us from full relationship with our Lord. Amen.